Lord Advocate. Uh, Lord President, Justices, my Lords, uh, Lady Dean of Faculty, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the attendance this morning of so many distinguished persons in the legal profession and beyond to honour Lord Hope is testament to the high regard in which Lord Hope is held. In this world of globalisation in which we live, where self-advancement and reward is a common trait, we should never overlook the value of public service. It is not something which is consigned to a bygone age. Lord Hope is a living embodiment of that. He embodies the ethos of public service. Uh, Lord Hope has served with the Seaforth Highlanders, rising to the rank of Lieutenant. He has been an advocate, standing junior in Scotland to the Board of the Inland Revenue, an advocate deputy, Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, Lord Justice General of Scotland and Lord President of the Court of Session, a Lord of Appeal in the House of Lords, Second Senior Lord of Appeal in the House of Lords and Deputy President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. If that uh, was not enough, he is a Knight of the Thistle and Chancellor of the University of Strathclyde, during which period the University won UK University of the Year. And I know that that award pleased Lord Hope greatly. I first got to know him as Lord Justice General in the Appeal Court in Edinburgh. The Appeal Court is a formidable place uh, to appear, as this court is. It was once described to me as the best laxative known to man. <laughs> uh, court 3 in Parliament House, where the Appeal Court sat during Lord Hope's time in post, was recently redecorated. It is reported by the company who conducted the redecoration that advocates' blood was found on all four walls in the court. <laughs> and it is against that background that I spent my formative years as a lawyer in the appeal court. However, I can attest to Lord Hope being a pleasure to appear before, a template uh, for how a judge should behave. I marvelled at how Lord Hope, after a day of complex legal argument, would immediately deliver his judgment, which would be recorded and issued without any requirement for alteration. And I remain astonished by the clarity that you brought, brought to proceedings. The role of advocate deputes, a High Court prosecutor in Scotland, is a demanding one. And in conducting research for this morning, I learned that you dealt with many iconic cases during your time as an advocate deputy. These are too numerous to detail in the short time I have available, but include cases such as Tudor against O'Neill, which looked at the classification of offensive weapons, Boyne, which looked at fairness of questioning of a suspect, uh, long before CADA, and Campbell against Mackenzie, which looked at post-accident consumption of alcohol. What I particularly noticed in looking through the cases from this period is the very high regard in which you were held by the bench at that time. Throughout the case reports, there are numerous references from the bench to your valued contributions. And of particular note, there are many references to the brevity of your submissions. And I thought I would mention this to demonstrate that it can be done. <laughs> uh, this ability to succinctly summarise complex areas of law no doubt stood you in good stead when you argued the appeal of Struthers, Lockwinnock Limited, against Tudor. This case uh, considered very, very complex European Union regulations and driver's records, uh, driver's ages, working hours, and so forth and so on. And the case was summarised in the judgment by Lord Hunter, who said rather pithily, this appeal raises a single and short point namely whether or not the flat bottom lorry used by the respondent for door-to-door -door selling of coal was a specialised vehicle within the meaning of the regulations. One may remark, incidentally, that the task, difficult enough for a lawyer, must present problems to a door-to-door -door salesman. <laughs> I'm sure you will not forget uh, you dealing with uh, the appeal of a fraudster uh, by the name of Faboro, who had perpetrated a number of frauds on banks in the Aberdeen area. And these were the days when it was easier to get blood out of a stone than get money out of a Scottish bank. But Mr Aboro managed to achieve this. 
At trial, the accused relied on the Scottish defence of it wasn't me, a big boy did it and ran away, and gave evidence, and this is in the case report, I'm sure Lord Hope will recollect it, that he opened accounts unwittingly on behalf of a man from London called Mr. Dupe. <laughs> <laughs> Unsurprisingly, a good Aberdeen jury didn't fall for this and convicted Mr. Faboro. Not only was he sent to jail in order to be deported, but to add insult to injury, a compensation order of £427.86 and a half pence <laughs> was made. So Scottish justice not only took the last penny out of his pocket, but the last halfpenny. Lord Hope's contribution to Scots law has been immense. He has never been inward looking and has always strived to make Scots law as relevant, modern and outward looking as possible. Perhaps I can end by quoting his own words back to him from a speech to young lawyers in 2011 words which demonstrate why he will remain an inspiration for future generations of Scots lawyers. Uh, you said, I believe very strongly that if the Scottish legal system is to be kept up to date and able to compete with the English system, our system must look outwards and not inwards as it adapts to the realities of modern life. One of the great virtues of Scots law as a mixed system was its willingness to adapt itself so as to keep pace with the way things were done elsewhere. Pride in our own system is one thing. Isolationism is quite another. We have much to gain by maintaining contact with the way that law is practiced in England and Wales and beyond. We have much to lose if we were to raise the drawbridge and cut ourselves off from the outside world. Very wise words. On a personal level, I know that Lord Hope always makes himself available to others particularly younger people. He is a giant intellect with a common touch. And I know you will hate me for saying this, but uh, for once you, have to, uh, you will have to listen to me. You're a legend in the Scottish legal profession, a great son of Scotland, uh, but most of all, you're a good man. I wish you well in your retirement, although knowing you, you will not be inactive. You've earned the gratitude of Scotland, and the United Kingdom for your lifetime of public service. Thank you very much indeed. Dean of, Dean of Faculty. My Lord, my Lady. Upon commencing the study of Scots law, <coughs> I acquired, as did so many of my fellow students, the standard text on the subject. Glogan Henderson's introduction to the law of Scotland. It was from this that most of my subsequent essays were carefully transcribed. <laughs> <laughs> the editors of the then current seventh edition were A.M. Johnston and J.A.D. Hope, with the assistance of a number of sub-editors. The preface to that seventh edition begins as follows. While the editors and their assistants each revised certain chapters, most of the work was done by Mr. Hope. <laughs> Time passes, but some things never change. <laughs> My Lord Hope enjoyed a distinguished career at the bar from his call in 1965 to his period as Dean of Faculty from 1986. And this was followed by his appointment to the bench as Lord Justice General of Scotland and Lord President of the Court of Session. Uh, Sir George Mackenzie, a distinguished Scottish jurist, once observed that it was for counsel to be creative and for judges to be determinative. Uh, many judges might disagree, and some counsel might not understand. <laughs> My Lord Hope's career, both at the bar and bench, has been marked by the ability not only to identify the problem, but also the solution. <clears throat> Rather than refer to the myriad of <laughs> complex cases in which he was engaged during his distinguished career, I would mention but one simple matter. 
By 1989, considerable concern had developed as to the manner in which the bench was dealing with the matter of bail in Scotland. There was talk of the need for legislation, or at least of a practice note. The matter came to the attention of the then Dean of Faculty, my Lord Hope, who arranged to accept instruction in a bail appeal. But quite what the duty judge thought when the Dean of Faculty appeared in the bail corridor at nine o'clock in the morning is not recorded. The duty judge, Lord Brand, not only received a detailed submission involving the citation of case law going back 60 years, but also acceded to a request to issue a written opinion. Lord Brand did so, noting the clarity of the submissions he had received and restating the law and practice with respect to bail in Scotland. No legislation nor any practice note was required Rather, the case of Maxwell and Sillers provided a swift and elegant solution to what is seen a very real problem in the administration of justice. Could there be any chink in the Lord Hope's armour? Reference was made by the Lord Advocate to his service with the Seaforth Highlanders, uh, and that prompted some inquiry. It can be confirmed that Lieutenant Hope was not cashiered from the Seaforth Highlanders. All that intelligence could reveal was that while serving with Sea Platoon in Germany, he had been subjected to compulsory Scottish country dancing. <coughs> this may have laid the foundations for his subsequent career, and indeed might be commended to the Judicial Studies Board as a character building exercise. The Lord Hope has illuminated the law, not only with his intellect, but also by means of the care and industry which he has brought to bear in every case in which he has appeared, both as counsel and in which he has sat as judge. I would also wish to acknowledge the consideration which is invariably extended to counsel, even in the face of provocation. We are most grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Lord Panic. Uh, my Lords, my Lady, in 2011, the BBC broadcast an excellent programme, the highest court in the land, which starred uh, my Lord, Lord Hope, as well as some other members of this court. And the programme contained a valuable summary, in my Lord's own words, of the Hope philosophy. And I'm not referring to the scenes of your Lordship doing the judicial shopping. Uh, first, the importance of fairness. Your Lordship referred to the sense of unfairness felt by the young uh, David Hope at school when reprimanded for doing something uh, that your Lordship had not done and had not had an opportunity to respond uh, to the allegation. Uh, I would not be surprised to hear that the errant schoolmaster received a memorandum uh, explaining the principles of uh, fairness <laughs> with reference to all the relevant uh, authorities. Uh, it is, I think, appropriate uh, that your Lordship was responsible for the series of judgments from Porter and McGill onwards, uh, which set out the test of the fair-minded uh, observer. Uh, secondly, your Lordship referred in the programme to the importance of the rule of law. And in the Jackson case, the Hunting Act case, uh, your Lordship said the rule of law enforced by the courts is the ultimate controlling factor on which our constitution is based. Uh, third, your Lordship stressed the importance of avoiding emotion in court. A case must be decided dispassionately and objectively which, as your Lordship emphasised, does not mean a lack of sympathy for those who are before the court. And finally, your Lordship stressed the importance of a judgment being expressed clearly for the benefit of those who will read it and who have to apply it. Uh, my Lords, my Lady, on behalf of all the users of this court, 
lawyers and lay clients, I want to express our thanks to your Lordship for the skill and the integrity that your Lordship has shown in applying each of these central principles of fairness, the rule of law, objectivity and clarity. Uh, my Lord, Lord Hope was the last serving Lord of Appeal in Ordinary to speak in the chamber of the House of Lords in a non-judicial uh, capacity. Uh, that is before the creation of this court. There are many who look forward to Lord Hope returning to the House of Lords to contribute your powers of analysis, your wisdom, and your experience to legislative business now that the judicial business is done. Thank you very much. Mr Guthrie. Um, my Lords, my Lady, Lord Hope, um, it is my special privilege to pass on the good wishes and the deep appreciation of all who have been touched by your participation in the jurisdiction of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. I regard this as a particularly special privilege because I have the opportunity to speak not only for the very many members of our own legal profession and, for, and so for all those members of the bar, Privy Council agents and solicitors who practice here and find themselves before the board, but also for the many, many advocates and attorneys who normally practice far afield in the more or less distant reaches of the board's jurisdiction. Usually, uh, they find themselves here, either here in this building in Court 3, usually, or previously, they found themselves in Downing Street when your lordship has so often been one of the panel hearing their petitions and appeals. My lords, uh, I know that these hearings in their highest court have often been not only among the high points of those advocates and attorneys' careers, but also, at least in prospect, among the most alarming and potentially intimidating. So I should like to mention the manner in which you've received us all, uh, your unfailing patience and your unkind attention to what we've had to say, which has always been much appreciated and has gone some way to dispelling our initial trepidation. It's also ensured that we've left the court with the knowledge that our case has been carefully heard and will be carefully considered, shall I say, reinforced. Um, one apparently small thing that I know my colleagues from the Commonwealth have to thank you for is the introduction of the appropriate national flag um, now always displayed in open court <coughs> according to the jurisdiction <coughs> from which the appeal has been brought. In reality, it is not a small thing, um, but something much appreciated by the advocates when they see it, and an immediate tangible expression of the fact that it is their case from their country, which is now the focus of their highest court, and they have you to thank for this. Um, my Lord, it's no secret that the Privy Council jurisdiction is sometimes, uh, no doubt, usually very politely questioned by certain persons, some of whom may even, equally politely, question whether it retains its attraction to an equal degree for all of your Lordships. I have to say that I have never heard even a breath of such a heretical view expressed with regard to your Lordship. And indeed, I never ever expected to, because you have always made it clear that the Commonwealth jurisdiction would always retain the greatest importance for so long as it is required. You were, of course, one of the judges who traveled with the board on its first excursions into foreign territory. My Lord, I was fortunate to be there on two occasions in the character, as I saw it, of something of a camp follower. But I recall clearly the introductory remarks you made when presiding in the Bahamas and in Mauritius, in which you simply explained the board's approach, set the tone for the hearings to follow, and dispelled any misconceptions, not only for the lawyers, but for all the many members of the public who were present in court. My Lord, I don't know um, if your plans for the future include a return to those jurisdictions in a civilian capacity. 
But if they do, I can guarantee that you're assured of the warmest of welcomes. And it may be, my lord, that in Mauritius, you may even have the sight of an albatross, mm. which I was told you would hope to see while in the Southern Hemisphere. But my lords, in conclusion, all the users of the Privy Council will miss you, but we are, of course, delighted to wish you the very best for the future in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Looking at Lord Hope, it is very hard indeed to believe that he's really about to be 75. And listening to him and working with him, it is even more difficult. He's the personification of the adage that 75 is the new 45. <laughs> While on the subject of age, it's excellent to see his grandchildren here in court today uh, to bring down the perceived average age of those attending uh, the celebration of Lord Hope's enormous achievements at the bar as Lord President and since October 1996 in the highest UK court. The past 15 years uh, have been marked by extraordinary changes in the United Kingdom's constitutional settlement. Most notably, Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Irish uh, devolution, the changes to the House of Lords, the introduction of the Human Rights Act, uh, Human Rights Convention into UK law, the development of EU law, and the formation of the Supreme Court. As the one member of the UK's top court during the lead up and the implementation of all these changes, Lord Hope has had a profound influence on the development of the UK constitutional settlement into the 21st century. He has given either the leading speech or one of the leading speeches in every Scottish devolution case that has been heard. And it's not merely in relation to Scotland. Lord Hope has made important judicial pronouncements on Welsh devolution. The political and legal implications of the decisions could have been problematic. But thanks to Lord Hope's wisdom and sensitivity, and uh, as has been said by Lord Panic, his conspicuous fairness and integrity, these decisions have rarely led to controversy or uncertainty. The landmark cases in which Lord Hope has made a leading contribution in relation to human rights law and EU law are legion. They include the very important Smith case, decided only last week. The adaptation of domestic UK law to accommodate human rights and EU law could have led to conceptual muddles and was bound to lead to outcries in the media. However, Lord Hope has consistently ensured that the development of the law in this novel and fundamental area has been as coherent, as comprehensible, and as practical as possible. In its judicial capacity, of course, Lord Hope's contributions have not been by any means limited uh, to constitutional issues. His learned and clear judgments in a plethora of cases during his remarkable 17 years as a law lord and justice of this court represent a remarkable achievement in themselves. They are clear, careful, coherent and principled, and I have to say extremely quickly produced. Uh, a, a, a conspicuous industry uh, uh, demonstrated, as the Dean of Faculty has mentioned. His many contributions to English law are particularly impressive and refreshing. The cross-fertilisation of ideas between Scots and English legal systems, which is of such value to both, are epitomised in many of David Hope's judgment. judgments. Uh, as the Lord Advocate has said, uh, he combines great intellect uh, with a common touch. The infinite care uh, Lord Hope takes when preparing cases is apparent from his meticulous notes, which I can sometimes see when sitting next to him in court but the handwriting is far too small for me to read what he has written. <laughs> the infinite care he takes over his decisions is self-evident from the outstanding judgments. I am told that it was no different uh, when he was an advocate. The lights were always on at three o'clock in the morning in the study at India Street, Edinburgh, and at the Scots Bar, his outstanding ability was recognised uh, by his election as Dean of Faculty and his subsequent elevation direct to the Lord Presidency, followed by his speedy promotion to the House of Lords. Those speak for themselves as achievements. The Dean of Faculty, I am told, and I hesitate to say this in the presence of the present Dean, is a post with much greater powers uh, than his Sassanac equivalent. I'm informed by Lord Reid that as an advocate, he was only able to go on his honeymoon after obtaining permission of the Dean, David Hope. That is real power. <laughs> 
I'm told that when Dean, uh, Lord Hope, was addressing the faculty on the difficult and contentious issues of marketing by members of the bar, he was standing in front of the window, and as he reached his peroration, a bus stopped directly outside with a strap line by the window, presumably paid for by an evangelical group, saying, there is hope. <laughs> a sign, another sign of his powers, no doubt, as Dean of Faculty. His time as Dean of Faculty no doubt assisted Lord Hope when he chaired the committee of three law lords, masterminding all aspects of the move from the House of Lords to this building. In that task, he no doubt benefited from his coxing days at Cambridge. It was a difficult, time-consuming and intricate task, and it's a great tribute to Lord Hope, as well as to Lady Hale, Lord Mance and Jenny Rowe, our Chief Executive, that their hard work produced such an impressive result, a building whose external and internal character and whose management and communication systems befit the UK Supreme Court. See Monumentum Requeries, circumspeaking. No law lord has been more interested in or knowledgeable about the workings of the House of Lords than Lord Hope. His expertise has proved extremely valuable in helping to maintain a proper understanding in the Supreme Court of the workings of Parliament, and not just the House of Lords, as anyone who reads his judgment in last week's Bank Malat No. 2 case can see. I'm sure, indeed I know, and as has recently been confirmed uh, by Lord Panic, his retirement from the west side of Parliament Square, while deeply regretted by his present colleagues, uh, will be welcomed by his future colleagues uh, on the other side of Parliament Square. A apart from his enormous contributions to the constitution and law of the United Kingdom, Lord Hope has also given a lot to other countries across the world through his membership, indeed his leadership, of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. As Mr Guthrie has so eloquently said, Lord Hope has been characteristically aware of the importance and sensitivity of the Judicial Committee's role and characteristically conscientious in his commitment to its work, both when sitting and when maintaining contact with, and indeed visiting, the judiciary of the countries which we in the JCPC are so pleased and proud to serve. It would be wrong for me to end without mentioning my own personal debts to David Hope. When I first became a law lord in January 2007, he and I had never met. Yet it was he who took it on himself to show me around the House of Lords, to explain to me the arcane procedures, both of the House in general and of the Law Lords in particular. He took characteristic pains and a great deal of time to make me feel at home in a very new and unfamiliar environment. More recently, when I took up this post last October, Lord Hope educated me generously and let me benefit from his substantial and deep experience and knowledge of the law lords, of this court, of Parliament and Scotland. Without him, I would have made many mistakes. The unkind may say even more mistakes. I have been very fortunate that he has been there to keep me on the straight and narrow, to discuss problems, uh, to give unstintingly of his experience and wisdom. I am very privileged to have been his colleagues. And may I add, uh, that uh, this care, consideration and conscientiousness has been reflected in his dealings with all the staff of this court who I know are very, very sorry uh, that he is going. All his colleagues, past and present, have been very privileged uh, to have sat and to have worked with Lord Hope and I'm delighted uh, to see uh, many of them uh, turning up here today, uh, many of his past colleagues turning up, up here today. Uh, Lord Wilson, uh, who tells me that he received a very similar kind uh, and welcome reception from Lord Hope, uh, as I did when he came here, wishes me to say how very sorry he is here that he cannot he, he, he is that he cannot be here this morning, uh, having been uh, committed over a year ago uh, to an unavoidable uh, appointment. However, it is fitting that the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales is here in his place. Our loss is the House of Lords' gain. Lord Hope will continue to serve the United Kingdom with all his wisdom, expertise and experience from across the road. And we all hope that he will continue uh, to come here and we will see him frequently. We wish him and Lady Hope 
all the very best of happiness and health for a long time to come. If anyone deserves it, they do. My Lords and my Lady, Lord Advocate, Dean of Faculty, Lord Panic, and Mr. Guthrie, uh, I must say, as I've been listening to all of you, uh, my feelings are a mixture of regret, gratitude, and to be perfectly frank, an element of disbelief. Um, of course, regret at leaving this court, which uh, I've enjoyed being part of so very much since it, its inception only about four years ago. And gratitude for your very kind remarks, each one of you re recalling stages of my career. But there is a sense of disbelief, because in my case there has been absolutely no winding down. Uh, this term has been a very busy term. This week has been a week just like every week. Uh, yesterday and today have been so far just exactly the same as always, and suddenly I'm confronted by this. And I find it extremely difficult to believe that actually the moment has come when I have to leave. I feel a little bit like uh, somebody who's been playing a, a vigorous game of rugby and um, the, the, your team is just about to, to win, and 10 minutes from time you're extracted from the mall by the referee and shown a red card. <laughs> uh, I look around to see whether there's some mistake, and perhaps they've picked the wrong man. But I do realize that uh, age does catch up with you eventually, and abrupt though it is, and no winding down there, there has been, I do realize that the time has come. Of course, I did r appreciate some time ago that this was going to happen. It was brought home to me most forcibly when I opened my cupboard one day and saw that my Supreme Court robe had disappeared. Uh, it was due to Jenny Rowe, Jenny's wonderful attention to detail because she had appreciated that the hem of that garment would have to be lengthened somewhat for my successor. <laughs> so it disappeared and it never reappeared and each day I've seen the absence of this robe as a, as a solemn warning that time was passing. <laughs> Gratitude, of course, to the many events that have brought me to, 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 to where I am today. I think most of all, Dean of Faculty, I, I owe everything to the faculty. Because you may not appreciate, but I certainly do remember, that I was elected dean as the outside candidate by the smallest possible margin. And you can work out what that means. It could quite easily have gone the other way. As it happened, I, I had um, been in office for three years when my predecessor, Lord Emsley, announced that he wanted to retire. Now, this was a quarter of a century ago, and he uh, said that he wanted to nominate his successor. The Prime Minister, in whose gift it was, refused to accept that and said uh, that, sh that uh, three names would have to be provided, and it fell to the Lord Advocate to provide three names. Uh, nobody was more astonished than I was when the late Lord Fraser, whose death we very much regret, uh, said that he wanted to put my name on the list. And he, told, he announced this to my predecessor, who exploded with anger and said he's not even a judge. <laughs> and I can imagine the Judicial Appointments Commission having exactly the same uh, reaction, and it would never have dreamt of me to apply for this post. However, the three names went forward, and the Prime Minister, uh, she, because it was Mrs. Thatcher, selected me. And I owe a lot to her for being brave enough, as indeed I owe to Lord Fraser, to make that selection. Uh, had, I, had I not been Dean, that would certainly not have happened, and that's why I really owe everything to that vote, uh, that election, uh, so many years ago. Uh, well, as for the 24 years since then, I've had a very sheltered life. I've sat entirely as an appellate judge. I, I used to say to my principal clerk in Edinburgh from time to time, do you not think it would be a good idea for me to... Um, do a criminal trial. After all, as the Lord Advocate has been reminding me, I was a deputy and knew the inside of a court fairly well. I always get, got the same reply, we think it would be most unwise. <laughs> <laughs> so I never was exposed to the, the risk of um, sitting alone in a criminal trial, and I've always had the support and uh, encouragement and shelter of at least two colleagues, and latterly at least uh, four, sometimes more, in the various appeals in which I've sat. I'm not sure how successful I really was as Lord Justice General, despite the Lord Advocate's very kind remarks. Uh, he may recall 
that um, uh, I was somebody who, on the whole, was a little bit impatient and didn't always abide by the rules. Uh, my colleagues didn't approve of this, and uh, I was probably reversed more often, had my judgment set aside more often and more frequently and more quickly than any other Lord Justice General before or since. Uh, and they had a field day when I left, and uh, many cases were set aside. One or two survived, but it was uh, a relief to me to come down to London and find that for somebody who found himself wanting to change the rules, I found that my colleagues were challenging the rules all the time. <laughs> and, uh, that was a, a breath of fresh air. It was a great relief, but also an enormous privilege to sit uh, throughout the remaining 17 years of my career with so many distinguished jurists. Uh, I think really, to be frank, I was, if we think of the barbarians, in, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the English team, the British team, uh, the Lions in Australia, I'm one like most of the few Scots on the team who would be the midweek player, really, not, not the test player. But um, around me were people, and they're all here, and many of their predecessors are here too, with a remarkable speed of thought, ability to see things that never occurred to me, and made an immense contribution, because we all filter things, develop things from each other, an immense contribution to what I did. And if I got a little bit better than midweek player, it's entirely due to them. And it's been an enormous privilege to share these experiences with them. I, I do regret this is all over. Um, I've had two occasions now when I've been disqualified. Uh, the first time, uh, as Lord Panic reminds me, I was given a yellow card and my time off the pitch has almost finished and I can go back in. <laughs> but this time it is a red card and I know that means that I just am off the pitch and there's no way back. Uh, I, I leave with a sense of regret, as I said, but an immense sense of, sense of gratitude to all those who've sustained me at various stages in my career. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Well, like um, Lord Hope's career in this court. All good things come to an end. Thank you very much indeed for coming. The court is now adjourned.